Welcome to the Internet of Things podcast. This is your host, Stacey Higginbotham, and your co-host, Kevin Tofel. And we have, oh, we have an aloha show for you today. Okay. Aloha. Aloha. We are going to talk about Facebook's plans, possibly for a smart speaker. We're going to talk about how Google took sensors and AI and saved a lot of money in data center cooling. We've got a new survey about how scary IoT is, plus a couple exploits that show how scary IoT is. In our news bits, we've got some acquisitions to talk about, industrial IoT, and the Fitbit Charge 3. And this week, our guest is Tyler Baker, who is the CTO of Foundries.io. This is a brand new IoT platform from the people who brought you Linaro. And this is, we'll, we'll talk about it. It's basically offering security as a service and a couple interesting points there. And we're going to have a message from our sponsor, Netgear talking about their Insight Wi-Fi system. So let's get this show started with a message from another one of our sponsors. This week's sponsor is Afero. Are you looking for an IoT platform? Find out why Kenmore and D-Link picked Afero. Afero customers have experienced as much as 80% reduction in time to market, 99% fewer support calls, and a 10x higher activation rate. Plus, they can reuse 90% of their work from one project to the next. To learn more, visit afero.io. That's A-F-E-R-O dot I-O. Okay, Kevin, let us get this party started. Let's talk about Facebook. Aloha. Yeah, I don't know if they mean hello or goodbye, but that is their voice service that they are planning to do. There's code out there for Aloha, even leading to additional code talking about a smart speaker called Portal. And I think we talked about a Facebook speaker in the past because they were supposed to or rumored to be rolling out a speaker earlier last year. And the rumored price was like $4.99. That is high, one. And two, it actually makes sense because Facebook doesn't make any hardware. So I don't know what kind of economies of scale they have to build off of at this point, right? So that's going to be a challenge for them if that is true on the price. But uh, the, I, I was yes. going to say the bigger challenge, I think, is privacy. Privacy that Facebook, yeah. people, people don't really trust Facebook. And that was why they kind of put their plans on hold, it sounded like originally. I don't think they've actually solved their problems with people worried about privacy. I know that people are still on Facebook, but think about how prevalent the rumor is that, you know, Facebook is constantly listening in, even on your phone. People think this all the time because they'll be talking about something and then suddenly they'll see an ad for it on Facebook. Mm hmm. Ah. Yeah, that's a good point. And in fact, the whole speaker plans seem to fall apart last year when there were major privacy concerns brought up by the U.S. government with the election and other consumer issues there. So yeah, and it made sense to back off on that at the time. I'm not even sure it makes sense to continue it, though. You tell me. And I do use Facebook. I use Facebook for my private stuff. We have a Facebook page for Stacy on IoT. So we use it you know, from a business standpoint. And I use Messenger with the family because that allows me to be cross-platform since I switch phones a lot. So I, they're all on iMessage, but I'm like, if I'm on Android, you can't get me there. So I don't really see the point of this because they want to add voice to their messaging apps and perhaps through your posts, even through Instagram as a chat service. And I don't see a huge benefit there from an end user standpoint. I certainly see a benefit for Facebook because maybe they'll get even more of our data. But what do you think, even though you may not use Facebook as much as I do? Well, it might be because when you talk to Facebook Messenger, you're actually using Google or Apple's speech to text, right? Yes, because that's the keyboard will pop up. So whatever keyboard you're using, and it could be a third party keyboard, in fact, on an Android phone, well, even on an iPhone. So somebody else is getting the data. Facebook is not. The only thing you can do natively in the app is record a voice clip, which then gets sent as an audio file. Okay, so Facebook probably wants access to that sweet, sweet voice data, because then you can build all kinds of products. And then another idea, and this does not thrill me at all, but diehard Facebook users might, but imagine something like Google's clip camera that uses machine learning to understand when to take the best pictures. Maybe imagine like something like that in your home from Facebook, and then you could just send those pictures to your loved ones. I would, again, never do that. 
But I would never do that either. But your point makes more sense when you even think about the patents that Facebook has, which also came to light this week via TechCrunch, who reported this story. They have, they being Facebook, has a patent for a smart speaker as well as a smart camera and a video camera. So doesn't mean they're going to use those patents for actual products, but you're right. They could go down the path you just mentioned. Yeah. I mean, because I associate Facebook with connecting with your family, right? And so- Connecting people. Yep. I guess. I mean, it's really a shame that we don't have unified platforms for video chat. Thanks, Apple, with FaceTime (laughs) and Hangout. I guess Hangouts you can put elsewhere, but I'm just kind of like, you know, the telephone, it works so well, right? And now we're adding video and we want to share so much more with our loved ones and we got nothing. The telephone was great, except that little rotary thing with numbers on it. It just doesn't make sense to millennials. It's actually kind of funny. And cords. But, They're puzzled by cords. Yep. Okay. Let's talk about, ooh, this is an IoT story, sort of. It's being media. It's, it's an AI story, and it is. But it's why you put all these sensors in places. It's not because you're like, oh, I love sensors and data. I just totally want to, you know, be a wash in it. It's so you can actually do cool things like Google who basically saved 40% in cooling costs or electrical costs for their data center, thanks to AI. And again, the sensors that got to pull that data. So every time we talk about businesses and IoT, we're talking about kind of this idea of digital transformation. This is a really great and scary example of doing that and moving from the AI making recommendations to people to actually taking action and automating it. And this is a really scary step. Whenever I talk to industrial IoT people, they're like, oh, that's a terrible idea. We'll never do it. Well, they may not, but Google did. And again, energy savings of around 40%. And see, I think this is what people lose when they talk about IoT because it means so many things to so many different people. We've had data collection and big data for several years now. Analyzing data is not new. Doing something automated based on the data, that is new and it's or new-ish. scalable in a way that, yes. you know, like people can have a bad day and not notice something. And then you can make even finer, more finely tuned things when you're automating based on machines. <sighs> yep. I'm with you. I'm excited about that. So this is a big deal. It almost actually, the energy savings they garnered from this almost made up for the cost and energy use increase of adding new data centers. So this is a big deal because as you guys are all aware, hey, we're increasing our digital footprints. We're using more, you know, connected devices. Thus, we need to build more data centers. And eventually we're going to be like, data centers are sucking all our power. So about 1.8% of all electricity generated, according to a report in 2016. Which is a long time ago. That actually, that report was saying that by now we'd be, or we'd almost be screwed. But so far, we're using things like renewables and techniques like this to keep it relatively flat, which is good. Now we just need the Bitcoin miners to stop. They have. Did they crash? Yeah, a lot of areas have. Yep. So speaking of Bitcoin, (laughs) let's talk about scary things. This is a survey from Dynatrace that basically said that over half of consumers worldwide are using IoT devices, but roughly two thirds of those have already encountered performance issues. And those, as someone with lots of devices, I can tell you, yes, this is a true statement. The consumers experience on average 1.5 digital performance problems every day, and 62% of people fear the number of problems they encounter and the frequency will increase due to the rise of IoT. We just call that glitches. So many glitches. Yeah. This particular stat was interesting as well. 72% of consumers say it's likely that glitches in IoT apps will cause serious injuries. Yes. That's not good. Yes. That's not good. But of course, they're including in this survey, they talk about self-driving cars and so on and so forth. So yeah, you have a glitch there. and Certainly, you'll probably have an injury, but regardless, yeah, that's it's a valid concern. So some of the quote unquote performance issues they're worried about are being locked out of your smart home because of bugs in their smart home technology. That's, has that ever happened to you, Kevin, being locked out? It has not. And part of the reason it has not is because I wisely, two years ago when we bought this house, I have never carried a key to this house, but the smart lock I bought has a keypad as well. So the only way I can be locked out is if the batteries actually die. Yes. And that is the good way to do it. So however, 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 just like people use the little hide a keys to actually hide a key somewhere, some of these smart locks 
have 9 volt terminals hidden underneath them. If you have a 9 volt battery, you can give enough juice to actually get in your house. I'm not saying I hit a battery, but you never know. I like No, that. it's true. No, it's that true. makes sense. That totally makes sense and that's I don't I don't carry a key, I carry a 9 volt. Like, eh, all right. A little uh, steel wool, I can start a fire. Really? Yes. Absolutely. Put steel wool on a 9 volt battery and you, it turns into flames. Oh. Very handy for camping. I'll keep that in mind, except you're burning toxins, but okay. Well, Other- life or death situation, you're- You're right. You know. You're right. Okay. Yeah. You're my friend. I'll carry steel wool. You carry your battery, and together, when we- Conquer camp, the world. We're like, we're ready for the apocalypse. Okay. <laughs> Look so- out, zombies. <laughs> Let's talk about some of the other performance problems, you know, associated with the IoT, not the apocalypse. 64% of customers fear not being able to control lights in their smart home. Okay, this has happened to me on so many occasions. I'll ask Madam A to do something, it won't happen, or somehow my connected lights will become disconnected from something, or they'll get reset and they'll blink. So this is a legit fear. Agreed. Same here. And this is kind of a This is why we think trust is so big. 81% of consumers are concerned that technology or software problems with smart meters will lead to them being overcharged for gas, electricity, and water. So Hmm. I've never thought about that, but that's valid. It is. And billing mistakes happen all the time, both from like, you know, your electrical provider all the way from like Verizon in your phone bill. And this is not necessarily a function of like sensors and IoT tech as much as it is like billing systems on the back end. Everything is automated. A lot of things make glitches. So I may start going out to my meters and manually recording because I never thought of this. I actually think that having two-sided, I guess, double-sided access to some of these things. So like there are devices like Curb or Smappy or I think Sense that you can install on your phone that measures your electricity consumption, for example. So you could actually check that against your meter. It may not be entirely the same, like one-to-one the same, but it should be within right. the same range. Yeah, yeah. And some of those, they go right into your electrical panel, if yeah, I recall. They yeah. Do. And so something like that, or having a water flow meter, you know, from like buoy mm-hmm. or, God, there's so many. <laughs> having those kind of things, you could actually double check this. So I actually think the IoT might help here. So, yeah, you get the added benefit because a lot of those water flow things will actually shut your water off because they're smart enough to know there's water flowing when there really shouldn't be or normally isn't. So it would prevent leaks. And then you get the added benefit of being able to monitor the actual flow as well. Yeah. So hmm. while I agree that IoT is going to add another layer of complexity to our already complex systems, I don't think it's we'll get more glitches, but you know, we still don't have systems in place really to affect the glitches we have already in our existing systems. Look at like what happened with a Verizon employee not turning not not throttling the firefighters in California. Mm. I mean, that's something that actually automation might help there, you know? Yes. <laughs> glitches. One would think, yes, as I'm working on this fire for how many weeks now, let's not throttle the fire men and women that are fighting this fire. So yeah. Anyway, I don't know. I feel like IoT, it's a problem we've had for a while. IoT doesn't change it. It just makes it a little more more complicated. But here's... It's because people don't understand all the things you can do once you've connected things like this. That's, to me, what it is. They haven't thought through every possible use case because there are so many. It's not until something bad happens. You're like, we could have prevented that. We have that data. And then the problem gets solved. Yeah, but that's kind of how technology develops anyway. I know, I know. I know. It's sad. Speaking of scary, this is an interesting article from Bleeping Computer talking about flaws in smart irrigation systems. And and this is actually <laughs> a team of Israeli researchers showed how if you attack a couple irrigation systems, so smart home or you can actually use them. I mean, campuses use them. All kinds of companies use them as well. But if you attack enough sprinklers, you can empty a water tower. So they attack sprinklers from Blue Spray, Green IQ, and Rain Machine. And they found many flaws, and they reported all their vulnerabilities. But in drought-stricken areas, this is actually a big issue and a problem. So do I tell people not to connect their sprinklers? I don't know. What's (laughs) the solution here? No, I mean, I wouldn't not have the product if you need it and you're aware of the vulnerabilities and the fact that these vulnerabilities are reported and will likely be fixed. I wouldn't say don't do it, but it's scary that if it's almost like a denial of service, like on the internet, if somebody had control and theoretically here, they did a damage calculation of 13,550 sprinklers, they could get rid of 3,700 
87 cubic meters of water in six minutes from a water tower. And that is what they say, typical water tower capacity. So in six minutes, you would drain the local water tower. And this actually ties to something I put in my newsletter last week. I had talked about, again, it's like a DDoS attack on the electrical grid. Basically, you can overwhelm an electrical grid if you pull too much demand from the system. Yep. So the idea was, oh, you just use, you know, you attack IoT devices and you increase air conditionings, for example, air conditioners to all run at the same time. I called it like flushing all the toilets at once in a door. <laughs> but again, this is, these are real world impacts from insecure devices that we might not think about. Like I might not be like, uh, you know, so my air conditioner has been running for an extra 20 minutes. But if you time it correctly across all of them, that could be a problem. That's a brownout. So there we go. Other scary things in the Internet of Things. A popular connected device. You may have heard of it. You may own it. I own several. I do too. Has been, oh, I guess we'll say has been hacked by McAfee researchers. Again, we talk about these things all the time. This one is pretty particularly difficult. So I'm not unplugging my Wemo stuff yet. So and it's only the Wemo Insight smart plug, which is an older model. I still I know they and I I have two of them as well. In fact, I recommended people use that to plug their hub into it because you could if your hub goes down, you could remotely restart your hub with a Wemo Insight smart plug. But yeah, you're right. This is a very particular attack. I wouldn't want people to panic over it. But the McAfee folks essentially downloaded or extracted the firmware off of an Insight smart plug, created their own little smart plug on a board, and then hacked it. And then they could punch holes in your router and all that. The thing is, they would actually have to be on your network to do this, be physically present. It's not a thing that you should worry about per se. And I'm sure that Wemo will fix it. But And it should be fixed. But yes, it's another vulnerability. Yes. So if anyone comes into your house, ask for your Wi-Fi password. This don't is, give it. Don't give it to them. Y'all, this is where I'm going to just stress the importance of guest networks. If you're going to build an IoT, and this is another thing, if you're going to build IoT stuff and you put them on a guest network and that's the same network you give to like your kids' friends, that's a bad idea too. So Just use the rule that I use. At my house, when you come over, it's BYOI. Bring your own internet. Just use your 4G, people. Oh, I'm going to have to show up at your door and see what I get. You're getting nothing. Dang Zippo. It. Zippo. Zippo. Okay. Moving on from terrifying things, let us talk about deals, mini team-ups, tie-ups, and more. So if you guys are familiar with the Vera Z-Wave Hub. A lot of people write to us. They love it. They use it. The company yep. that made that has been bought by a company called EZLO, which makes its own Z-Wave Hubs. So what can we expect from this? Uh, more Z-Wave Hubs? <laughs> well, it's interesting what EZLO, and I don't know if it's that or it's ESLO, but whatever. It's interesting what Z-Wave Hubs they make. They are super small. And one reminds me of the Samsung Smart Things Link USB stick that I have in my NVIDIA Shield, which adds Zigbee and Z-Wave to my Shield, and it makes it run the Smart Things software, so it becomes a hub. EZLO makes really small Z-Wave-only hubs. One is a USB stick. One is actually a plug. You just plug it into your electrical outlet. Yeah. And I love that idea. I love it because I don't want to see boxes all over. No more hubs. Your hub is now yeah. a functioning device. Correct. Yeah, so we could see the Vera software, which is pretty good and yep. really robust, on an outlet or yes. something you just plug into something else via USB, which would be cool. And Absolutely. Yeah, I don't know about EZLO's hub. So, okay. Never yes. used it. Never used it. No idea. So, C3 is another tie up. So, C3, which is Tom Siebel's company, they started out doing smart grids, smart energy management, have slowly transitioned to IoT and, of course, AI. They have done a link up with the Google Cloud. This means they support now the Google Cloud, Amazon, and Azure. What's interesting to me here is that Google has really beefed up their industrial IoT efforts. They did a deal with a company called Foghorn. They've done some others with industrial companies. So in the last like a year, maybe since CES, mm -hmm. they've really started digging into industrial IoT because they have been very far behind there in <laughs> enterprise IoT. Yeah, we've talked about that a number of times about what is Google's IoT strategy. It's just not a cohesive message and so on. But I agree with you. This year has been a big year of catching up. I'm not going to say they have caught up or haven't. We'll see. But this is definitely the year that they have made big strides. And just real quick to plug something, not smart plug, but just plug plug. 
I was on the Twit Network Know How Show, which they cover IoT, and I was a guest talking about Google, Android, Android things, all in industrial IoT. So I don't know if what I said made sense, but if you want to listen to it, you can go to twit.tv and hear it. I did listen to you. You made did I do sense. okay? You did okay. I mean, it's, I did okay. Like you, you did all right. Some of my and, stuff. So yes, was, I did. That was I was like, oh yeah, Kevin, yeah, you didn't yeah. say anything the, wrong. The other person was a HomeKit person with enterprise and industrial IoT, and I didn't agree at all with what he said. I didn't hear it until after it was published, so I couldn't rebut it, so to speak. But yeah, that could just be me. No, I'm with you. Ugh, okay. Terrible. We always agree. This is no fun. Okay. <laughs> Let's move on to Wi-Fi for airport security. I know this is a Wi-Fi story. Is it an IoT story? The only reason I put it in here is because we talk actually about various systems in the home that use Wi-Fi as a security system. So, you know, Wi-Fi is radio waves, you guys. And if you analyze those radio waves, you can see things. And apparently you can see things very clearly, according to this research. <laughs> mm-hmm. You can find dimensions of metal objects or estimate the volumes of liquids. And this is a 95% accurate system. And this might make it so you don't have to do things like pull your laptop out of your thing at the TSA line or, you know, put your toiletries in the three ounce containers in the Ziploc bag and run them through separately. The Wi-Fi system had a success rate of 99% for recognizing dangerous objects, 98% for metals and 95% for liquids. See, now here is a perfect use for something that they wouldn't use because it's pretty much a done product. Google Glass. If you had TSA agents while you were standing in line walking around, they could be getting the feedback from the Wi-Fi signals and seeing individuals and who should be taking stuff out of their bag because, hey, you got something metal in there that looks like a brick and I want to know what it is or you got too much liquid in there. That would be kind of cool. It would. And actually, you could disable the Google Glass so they couldn't take screenshots, which might make people feel a little bit better. Indeed. Yeah. Although, although, although that would also be useful for known travelers and people who are on the do not fly list. Oh, yeah. Mm. Mm. We're going to revive Google Glass on this show. Oh, dear. Or (laughs) I still have mine. Oh, that's why you want to revive it. But, and here's my cautionary tale, for those of you guys who are like looking at this for a security system and maybe feel more secure because it's not a camera, this is pretty granular. So it may not actually be a camera, but it's going to know a lot about you. So keep that in mind. And because Wi-Fi signals are not contained unless you live in a Faraday cage, you can actually read this outside your building. So people can actually, using this type of gear, see what's like motion and what's happening inside your house, even if they're not incited. Yep. All right. So that's my like, before we get all excited about this technology and think it's super cool, which I do. Oh, hold your horses. Let's just think about this for a minute. <laughs> all righty. Fitbit has a new device. They introduced the Fitbit Charge 3, which, okay, I'm excited about because I have a Charge 2 and I love it. I wear it almost every day. When I don't wear it, it means I'm losing with my best friend because we have a competition going on. Who can burn the most calories and take the most steps? So I think I might get this. I'm going to be due for a new Fitbit probably in six months or so. This one goes on sale October 1st. So I might pick it up. Yeah, this one is $150. I don't know what you paid for your charge to. I think it sold for $150. I'm not sure I paid that much for it. Okay. And as far as what you're going to get if you do upgrade, you will get app notifications, which you don't currently get on your Charge 2. I'm sure that's optional if you don't want them. I do not. That's easy to, no problem. I I would think you would because you don't carry your phone more often than not. And as long as you're in range of Bluetooth of your phone, you would get notifications. That could be important. I don't want notifications. I mean, I can get my texts already on my phone, but I don't want app notifications. But see, now... App notifications are actually useful for me because when I'm not near my phone and I'm on my Apple Watch and you ping me via Hangouts chat, which happens, we talk during the week on chat, on Hangouts rather, I get that on my watch as a notification and I know that you have a question. I can even see the question. So on the Apple Watch, I can even respond to the question. You don't know I'm not in front of a computer. Yes. You can't do that I don't on the charge. That. <laughs> okay. I don't want to know when Kevin wants to know something. I'm like if you really want to meet, if you really need to get me, you should probably call me. Or you should actually probably call my husband. Or you should should hack into my Wi-Fi system (laughs) and dim my Philips lights. And I'll be like, what the what? Huh? 
Yeah. Okay. So well, Stacey doesn't want app notifications, but everybody else can get them on the Charge 3. <laughs> on your Charge 2, you have an OLED display that you can tap. I know the Charge 3 has a touch screen, so I think you can do more than just tap. I think you can scroll around a little bit easier, which is probably better navigation. You can't go swimming with your Charge 2 because it's splash resistant. Charge 3 is water resistant up to 50 meters. So if you go scuba diving, you know, with the stingrays, that's useful. You should get seven days on the Charge 3. What do you get on your Charge 2 right now? Uh, Roughly, actually, I get about four to five days, depending on how much working out I do. (laughs) Right. And since you don't get app notifications, that's even that's helping your battery life, too, I'm sure. Yes. Since I'm such a curmudgeon who hates the Internet. Okay. Yeah. Yes. So I'm I'm all in on this. Now you are not. And the reason no. you're not is? Because I need GPS on my wearable because I run every day and I need to track how far and pace and splits and so on and so forth. So you can do heart rate on the charge devices, which I can do on my Apple Watch, but I have a built-in GPS as well. And this has GPS. It's not assist. It's connect. Well, so is what they the call it. Is- Uses your phone. Yeah, you can. I was like, you can get that. You just have to connect it to your phone and bring your phone with you. I don't want to run with my phone. And that is fine. So yeah. I don't run with my phone either. I don't run, period. So we're good. So yeah, and you know, Kevin and I were talking about what you want, because there's a lot of options out there in the, the tracker slash smartwatch slash whatever world. Mm-hmm. And it's kind of nice to say, you know what, I really need GPS, because that's going to narrow your options considerably. Very quickly, yes. For me, I want deep sleep tracking stats. And I also, for some reason, I'm obsessed with how many stairs I climb. So Mm -hmm. those are important to me, which, you know, is helpful. And I get that. I mean, I would never pick a device for you and vice versa. You know, I want what I want and need and so on and so forth. But a lot of people might be saying, why aren't you running with a phone? Because if you have a problem, you need to call somebody, an emergency. That's another factor that you should consider. I opted for the LTE version of the Apple Watch. So my family can call me, text me. I can call them in an emergency. I can call the police very quickly with the SOS feature. And my peeps can find me on Find My Friends because when I leave the home, that starts tracking the watch, not my phone. Yes. Oh, and I should tell everybody, remember back in the day when Fitbit bought Pebble? Some yes. of these, some of the watch faces that you can get on the Fitbit Charge 3 are the Pebble ones that we have not seen for a while. So, you know, if that's your Yay. thing, you can actually get them on the Charge 2 if you want. But, you know, just out there, it still lives a little bit. Yep. Okay, let's move on to just a little congratulatory note. Because... We follow CE Pro, which is an industry magazine for, this is the professional installer market for smart home stuff. So this is where I go to learn about, you know, Control 4 and Savant and all these fancy brands. They were bought this week by Emerald Expositions, which is the company that actually owns Cedia, which is the show for all those professional installers. I went last year, had a lot of fun. I'm not going this year, though. The emphasis on audio stuff was audio and home video was kind of yeah. too much for me. But, you know, congratulations to Julie Jacobson, who is Yay. the founder and the eminent, the grand dame, grand dame of smart home stuff. She's amazing. Yes. Yes. So, They've been doing that. CE Pro is 24 years old. I know. It's crazy. Yep. So, yeah. So good for her. Good for the CDO organization. And, you know, I guess, hopefully, I mean, Julie says it will become a puff piece kind of company. I can't imagine her participating in that. But no, as long as we see Julie, we should be okay. So congratulations to you, Julie, and everyone who's at CE Pro. Good work. Okay, now it is time for our voicemail. That is not our voicemail theme song, but We have a great voicemail for you from the IoT Podcast listener hotline, which is brought to you by Schlage. I should tell you not to miss your chance to win a Schlage Sense Smart Deadbolt and Wi-Fi adapter. You can only enter to win if you are in the U.S. or Canada. I'm so sorry, rest of world. But to enter to win, you have to dial 512-623-7424 and leave a voicemail asking us your IoT questions. Remember, smarter homes start with Schlage. And this week's voicemail is from Mark. Hi, Kevin and Stacey. My name is Mark Butler. I'm from Cleveland, Ohio. My question revolves around trying to track when one of my children arrives or leaves home. I know there's a Smart Things 
sensor that you can do, but that's something that guys maybe would like carry in their backpack or a key ring. I'm looking for something that might work with based on location of their phone tied in through my Wing Hub or my Amazon Echo ecosystem. I would think it'd be possible. I feel like it's the holy grail. I've been doing some internet searches and I'm coming up empty. Thanks so much, guys. Love the podcast. You should be doing it twice a week. <laughs> Thanks. Bye-bye. Oh, Mark, this is an eminently reasonable request, and you can do it so many ways. We can yep. we're gonna we're gonna tell you how to do it a variety of ways, ranging from free to oh my god, now I'm buying an entire home security system. So let's get started with free because we all like that. Kevin, you want to start with the iPhone version? So I don't know which phone platform Mark and his kids have. A option is to use the Find My Friends with your family. That is free. If you're on iOS, there are downsides right off the bat. When you set up a notification for, let's say, notify me when my kids come home, basically. When they come home, you'll get a message. The problem is it's a one and done thing. So I don't recommend it for an all the time use, but it is possible to do if you're on an iPhone. You could do it also on Android. They have a similar feature with Google Maps sharing. I've not used it for notifications, though. It's more of looking where people are, in a sense. You may be able to do notifications. I have not tried it yet. But those are two options, not ideal, but could work. But still keeping with the free, but now we've got maybe some more ideal stuff. You can actually put Ift, the service that ties web services together, on your handsets, be they iOS or Android. And you would put it on your kids' phones, too. And you would actually create applets that would say when this phone either geofenced or gets into connects to the home Wi-Fi, get a notification. So then you'd get it like a text. So that is free. Your kids do have to have that on their phone. So this is not surreptitious, but you know, your kids probably know that you're trying to track when they come home. Yeah. I wonder though, is there a trigger event for when somebody leaves the Wi-Fi network? Because Mark wants to track the arrival and departure Hmm. I think there must, on Android, I believe there is, because I have one where when I leave, when my phone, Android phone, leaves the Wi-Fi network, that's a trigger that I can use to take certain actions. Okay, then that should work but for free. that also means when your kids turn off their Wi-Fi network for whatever reason, you're going to get a notification. Right, if they disable the Wi-Fi radio, that's correct. So if you want to move up a layer, there's a couple options. You can add a camera with facial recognition. So doorbell cameras, I actually have a doorbell camera, the Nest that recognizes the people in my home. And when they walk by it, they're like, Anna just passed the door. Or, you know, they say Anna is home. So, or I think they just say Anna's at the door. So this is good. But if you don't have a camera in front of every door that your kids are going to use, this isn't going to work for you. And that may include a subscription fee. I'm thinking Nest Aware. It does does include the Nest Aware subscription fee. 10 bucks a month. Another option is you just have a desk camera and like facing the front area or an area that your kids have to pass through and you'll get the same sort of information. Right. You'll get a notification that movement has been detected and you can then go back into the Nest app and look and see what the movement was. And therefore, you could then see who is it and which way are they going in or out, etc. Slightly more proactive options include the lighthouse camera where you can say, tell me if you see my kids. <laughs> yeah which is kind of fun, but it's pricey. And that actually has a subscription. And if you're worried about like your kids sneaking out, we're trying to figure out like what exactly every possible. Doing. Yeah. I'm like, so if <laughs> yeah. you're worried about your kids sneaking out, my assumption is you're going to want to install something on their phone. That's going to be geofenced to your location or your Wi-Fi network. Cause they're not going to leave without their phone. Right. I actually have the Canary system, which you can find now on some decent discounts, quite honestly. I think I paid $179 or $199 for the base camera and one extension camera because I got it free. You can buy it now it, for 100 bucks. Well, there you go. So again, not free, but not too expensive either. And it's a home security camera system. It also measures air quality in your home, but it also does the geofencing for you as long as everyone in the family has the Canary app installed. And they actually want that installed. And I'll tell you why, because when they come home, if the alarm is active on the Canary, they can disable it on their phone before they walk in the door. 
Otherwise, you may have a siren go off or you may have a police get called by the canary system. So we have the geofencing it set up. So every time somebody in my home leaves the geofenced area or arrives, I literally get a notification on my Apple Watch and on my phone that so-and-so is home. So-and-so has left. So that's exactly what you want, Mark. And again, there's a cost and there's a subscription. It's $9.99 a month. I pay for, I think, the two cameras, but it has the geofencing, which is probably the best way to go if you don't mind spending a little money. There you go. So, Mark. Lots of options. Many options for you. Various price ranges. And I'm sure, actually, there are others that we didn't even cover. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I would try the free options, Mark. They may work for you, in which case, you know, you don't have to spend any extra money. Yeah. So good luck. And now stay tuned for our guest, who is Tyler Baker, the CTO at Foundries.io, which is a new company that's launching with an IoT security platform. We'll talk more about that after the break. Hey, everyone, we are taking a break from the Internet of Things podcast for a message from our sponsor. This week's sponsor is Netgear. And we have John McHugh, who is General Manager of Commercial Networking at Netgear, here to talk to us. We've been talking a lot about how Netgear has adapted the insight line for the Internet of Things. And now you guys allow companies to control their power over Ethernet devices over the insight line. Do you want to dig into that a bit? The Internet of Things and a POE are like perfect companions. One of the things that is more people are putting out solutions like monitoring cameras or security locks or speakers, various other Internet of Things controllers and monitors. They're finding one of the wonderful attributes of a network connection, a wired network connection, is you can power that device. No having to worry about batteries and other things. You can power it with a cable that's easy to run and doesn't represent an electrical shock hazard or require a specialized person to install it. And so what this means is it's kind of a do-it-yourself thing where you have this DC driven power that is now making all of your internet stuff operate. There's a lot of efficiencies around this. One of them is if you can power your network with like a backup generator in the case of an emergency, all of these devices are going to function as well off the same network cabling. So what I found most interesting about your control of power over ethernet devices was actually that it's not just control. You let customers handle automation tasks that are normally handled by completely different software. Can you talk about that? We knew when we were looking at the applications that were going to run on these networks that this power thing was very fertile ground. And if you look at most competitors' devices out there, I mean, they let you turn power on. They let you turn power off. We thought a lot about how customers were going to use this and thoughtfully created a bunch of features to enable the models that we thought fit with these devices. For example, I can power cycle a port. So, right, it's not turning it off and then waiting and then turning it back on. It push a button, it power cycles the device. That's something we need to do to remote devices regularly as part of the troubleshooting process. The other thing is people said, you know what would be really cool is if I could just turn off my Wi-Fi system. I mean, turn it completely off from when I leave at the end of the day to the next morning. What could be more secure than that? So you can schedule that your all your powered devices or a certain set of them will shut down at a certain time and turn on when you show up the next day at work. And so it provides you with this level of direct control and functionality that, frankly, standard solutions and competitor solutions just don't have. And where can we go to find out more about the Insight line of products? www.netgear.com slash insight. Hey everyone, welcome back to the Internet of Things podcast. This is your host, Stacey Higginbotham, and today's guest is Tyler Baker, who is CTO at Foundries.io. Hi, Tyler. How are you doing? I'm doing well, Stacey. How about yourself? Great. So I almost said Lenaro because that's where half of you guys are from, but you guys just launched your company this week. Quickly, let's talk about just very briefly what you're trying to do. So we're building a secure IoT platform that can be leveraged by many, many customers. And the idea is that it is secure, it is minimal, and it is updatable. And we have a couple different platform offerings, one for a deeply embedded RTOS, be like a sensor endpoint, and the other one would be for Linux class devices, maybe on edge gateways or even potentially enterprise servers. 
Okay. So for some of us, we're like, what, what, what was that? So let's talk about stories for a minute. What is the problem you are trying to solve? That is a great question. Really, what we're trying to solve is we're seeing the distributed denial of service attacks that have a higher bandwidth throughput than we've ever seen before. Some even, you know, researchers have thought it couldn't be possible. And where they're stemming from are compromised IoT devices, whether that's IP cameras, whether that's your router, they're being assembled in large botnets and they're being used to attack, you know, critical infrastructure. That's really one use case of what we're trying to solve is providing a platform for people or companies that would like to build IoT products and allowing them to be secure and allowing them to have update capabilities so that if there is an exploit found in their product, they can quickly update it. Security is our biggest concern and being able to have the latest software available for our customers because we believe the latest software is the most secure software is really our end goal. Let's talk about what it takes to create a secure IoT product because that's everybody's end goal is let's make this more secure. So what are the steps that need to happen? What is the bare minimum for a product yeah, so a bare minimum to us is a secure bootloader that can verify the images that are cryptographically signed so that an adversary couldn't inject their own operating system image into a device and take it over. The second thing is that the solution that is provided needs to be threat modeled in the sense that we identify the attack vectors and we decide which you know attack vectors are not in scope of the threat model. And the ones that are in scope, we model them and we say, here's the mitigations and we provide that to the customer. So we're under no impression that our software offering here is completely secure. In fact, I don't believe any software is completely secure. But what we do say is that we use the upstream software and we basically integrate it into a stable platform and deliver it to our customers continuously. If you want to look at something like Spectre or Meltdown, that bug, well, that exploit was fixed in the 4.15 kernel very quickly. However, with older LTS kernels like 4.4 that a lot of the distribution used in Linux, it took many, many weeks before those distributions could be updated, which means a lot of the cloud infrastructure that the internet runs on was essentially vulnerable to Spectre and, and Meltdown. So our goal is to provide the latest software that's been tested in a reference implementation that's been threat model. And when I say reference implementation, I'm talking about an end-to-end implementation. So a deeply embedded RTOS with sensors that's transmitting data to an edge gateway running our software, which then transmits the data to a cloud service. So that sounds good. I understand the kind of platform that's always updated with the latest, most secure version of the software. But you guys are... You're supporting a bunch of different versions of software because you've got your RTOS, you've got basic Linux, and then you've got container-focused applications. So explain how all of that works together. What we do is we are actually, we work upstream with those projects. A lot of us on the team are maintainers of them. So we have a good pulse on what the projects are doing and the directions that they're heading. This gives us an advantage, not only for making sure any code we write goes upstream and contribute it back to the project, but also being able to understand what's very important as far as security patches uh, that need to be applied to our platforms. So while it's very complex systems, we have... I believe the right expertise in the right places to help us achieve these goals. So let's talk about this from the perspective of someone building a product. If I'm making a light bulb, I need to put your Zephyr RTOS micro platform on the light bulb. And then I've got to put your Linux micro platform that's going to be on the hub or gateway that it's talking to the light bulb and then talks to the Wi-Fi. And then if I've got servers running in the cloud, that's also going to have the Linux micro platform on it. So none of those pieces have to be there. You could use the Zephyr micro platform independently of our Linux micro platform, or you could use them together. It really depends. So the way we've designed the software stack is that there's no lock-in since they're all based on open source projects. If you choose to use the Zephyr micro platform and maybe you've developed a proprietary gateway, we're using standard protocols like lightweight machine to machine, MQTT, so that all your edge gateway needs to implement as those protocols and they work with each other seamlessly. Same with the cloud side. We use standards there as well to allow people to plug in any cloud solution they'd like. So it really depends on the use case and where you see the value. But ideally, we'd love you to run the micro platforms at every level. Okay. So talk to me about how I would make this decision then, because actually first, tell me your revenue model. So am I being charged for every version of the micro platform? No. So you pay essentially a yearly subscription fee on the Zephyr micro platform. It is $10,000 a year and there's no per unit fee. So 
it is a per product fee. So if you have a software build, let's say your light bulb example, you have a monochrome light bulb variant and you have a colored variant, but they use the same software build that the software just reconfigures itself based on the hardware. That is only required for one subscription. Now on the Linux micro platform side, it's a little bit more complex and a little bit more expensive. It's $25,000 a year, but the same concept applies. It is a per product uh, subscription. Okay, so then what are the trade-offs and reasons I might run it on the edge, so on the light bulb versus on the gateway or in the server? So what we try to do is we realize that the enterprise software concepts, updating your software, using containers and virtual machines is really good practices. And there's these concepts are widely known by developers in the cloud side. But when you go to embedded, it's kind of roll, you know, choose your own adventure, depending on, on you know what you're building. And so what we'd like to see on the edge is that we can standardize some of the software deployment and the way people deploy their applications to the edge using containers, using virtual machines, and using the tools that the enterprise already uses so that you don't have to go and learn new tools or create your own. You can simply leverage the ones that already exist and already managing enterprise infrastructure today. Okay, so one of the challenges with connected devices is that companies don't tend to update them forever, right? I might expect something to sit on my factory floor for like 20 years or even 30, but the idea of supporting software for that long is just anathema to the IT guys. So with your experience from the embedded world, is this product going to help solve those kind of problems? I believe it is. And you kind of you know alluded to some of the problems that already exist in the industry. I think there's kind of two ways how this product helps you know, product developers that want to maintain a product or even customers that want their product maintained over a long period of time. Number one, when you're building products, especially when they're based on these open source projects like Linux or Zephyr, they move very quickly. And your product engineering team, you're on to the next product as soon as you ship the one that you are currently working on. So there's no time for you to really keep up to date with what's happening upstream and the security things that are being fixed there and the new features that are being added. So what we provide with our platform is a summary every three days, every five days, you know, something in that cadence where there's small bits of information that are easily digestible that you could read in you know, 15 minutes and understand what's happening so that product developers can be informed about the changes that are happening to the upstream software. The second part of that is we're doing a lot of testing internally, and our partners also do a lot of testing and feed the results back. So as the software is moving forward, ideally it gets better, and that's how it scales. But we're constantly offering the updates. So if you have a machinery that's on you know, an automation floor where it's doing some sort of process, or you could even say like a consumer device, like a refrigerator or a light bulb, necessarily the companies don't need to update it because there's no exploit. But when an exploit is found in their product, They want to be able to make a move to the latest software. And we basically provide breadcrumbs with these updates so that they can make it there, right? And we're constantly testing them so that there's a level of quality that we ensure at each step. So if I'm using something like this, my device isn't automatically secured. I still need to handle basic practices like encryption between my device and my gateway or all the best practices that you should have in the cloud in terms of storing data, storing passwords in databases, and Correct. all of that stuff. Yeah. So in our references that we provide, we've done that legwork for you. So we provide DTLS on the Zephyr RTOS micro platform, and we use MQTTS between the end device and the gateway, right? So we're able to show you, this is how you use encryption to move your data from the edge to the cloud and provide you the best practices there. So essentially our reference platforms that we provide are threat modeled and we provide you best practices for security. It's all built into the platform. So when it comes to security, one of the challenges is that a lot of these companies, four, five, six years down the line, they don't have the infrastructure to track and monitor, A, what's happening in the security world and their exploits, but B, they don't actually know how to track what's out in the world and actually roll out the security updates to it. So it's still a pretty complex, big thing to ask a manufacturer to take on security. So do you guys kind of help absolve them of that? Yeah, I think you're absolutely right. So for your question A, we do provide all the information on a regular basis about the security exploits and the fixes that are going into our platforms. So you're at least notified of that. Now, your second question is a little bit harder because, you know, yes, they don't have experience maybe running this infrastructure, but what we provide is an end-to-end reference. So essentially what we're providing is best practices, whether that's security or open source software practices or deployment practices, 
so that they have a starting point. They're not starting from nothing and have to do all their own research. They're able to leverage what we've built and build on top of that as part of their infrastructure. Now, the other important thing to realize here is that all of the software that we provide is open. So there's no lock-in whatsoever. If a company buys a subscription from us, they're able to cancel at any time and they have all the source code and the source code is based on projects that are open source. So if they decide that they want to take on managing their own infrastructure after a year, they have all the code to do so and they can create deployment plans off of that. All right. So let's talk about other security efforts. So you mentioned things like you have to have a secure boot. And this is not something you guys provide. This is something the underlying hardware that you choose should have. Correct? Some platforms do have cryptographic managers that store keys, right? And we will, our software will allow product makers to use that those hardware devices to store keys and such. The software that we provide is based on open source secure boot implementations. Those are the security measures that we've implemented at the low level to provide assurance that the operating system that's being booted on the platform is either from the product maker themselves or from us. Okay. And since I'm going to stick some of this at the edge, how much overhead do you guys need in terms of memory and compute effort? Yeah. So we're not at that point in uh, our lifetime where we need to optimize just yet. We plan on offering multiple flavors, something, you know, for like on our edge offering for the Linux micro platform that can run in RAM in like 256 megs of RAM. Then we'd have a next step up that runs in like 512 megs of flash. And then the image that we provide today has kind of got everything, you know, debug tools and things like that. And it's right around 800 megs. Uh, we have realized that that's obviously a little bit big for most applications, but the, what we do provide is a way to configure off all of the extra stuff and we provide documentation on how to do that if you do want to optimize for your product. The Zephyr RTOS side of things is kind of this, a similar manner. That can run in, I think Zephyr can run in 8K of RAM and a really minimal amount of flash. So the footprint is very small with Zephyr OS. There is some size requirements because we do support AV partition updating. So you do need to divide your flash in half, essentially, that you can have two images on the same chip and that they can be verified by the bootloader and then booted if there's an update. So we're working on optimizing it there. We're not completely optimized. We're kind of letting our customers guide us there. All right, you guys, thank you so much. This was super helpful. Tyler, thanks so much for coming on the show. Stacey, not a problem. Enjoy my time here. That's it for this week. Thanks so much for listening. And remember, if you'd like more IoT news, sign up for my newsletter at stacyoniot.com. We'll see you next week. 